Welcome back to the OSU Sports Extra Show. I'm your host, Juwan Lee, joined today by OSU beat writer Tyler Waldrop. It's going to be just a two-man show today, Bill, dealing with a little bit of some voice issues. So it's just going to be me and Tyler discussing all things Oklahoma State football. And I, Tyler, I, I don't know if you look at some of the fans, maybe they don't want to hear anything about Oklahoma State football. Maybe they just want to get to the next season. But um, they're coming off of a 42-20 to 20 loss against Kansas State this past weekend and you know the first question i had on my mind is how how did we get here tyler osu starts the season averaging 40 points then these past two games they go 19 points against utah 20 points against kansas state what has happened to this offense the past two weeks uh well i mean it's it's partly the early season's partly inflated by a, a tulsa team which uh you know hate to say it but it's not very good uh, that's, you know, so that explains that game. Uh, South Dakota State, uh, really good, but still an FCS team. So you should be able to move the ball on those guys. E even if they're a good FCS team, you should have a size advantage. Of, you know, there should be advantages. Um, you know, so Arkansas is kind of the, maybe Arkansas is an anomaly. And if you look back at the Arkansas game, Oklahoma State struggled to move the ball early in that. And then everything kind of clicks and Arkansas falls apart, but, um, you know, you, you can kind of look back and maybe if Arkansas is up 14, 17 points or, you know, maybe if Arkansas capitalizes and doesn't make mistakes, doesn't throw a pick six, maybe Oklahoma state's in a huge hole. And maybe that game kind of goes the same way the Kansas state game went. So I, I don't know that, uh, I don't know that the offense has suddenly regressed as much as it's just suddenly ran into better competition. Um, I do think it's kind of predictable. Um, just, uh, you know, Oklahoma State, uh, every now and then there was, you know, there was a drive against Utah, drive number two. I uh, in the I think I tweeted in the press box, I said, I can't wait to watch this offense. And then uh, the offense never did anything interesting ever again in that game, basically. Um <laughs> And and the same was kind of true against Kansas State. There was a, you know, early on, Oklahoma State was uh, mixing up its formations, doing some, giving some looks I haven't seen as much this year. And then uh, the game got away from them, and Oklahoma State went back to its bread and butter, which is, what, a, I don't know. I don't know how many plays it is exactly, but the beats are the same. Uh, I mean, everybody watching the video can probably come up with their own uh, Oklahoma State uh, playbook. And, you know, I mean, you, you kind of know what Oklahoma State's going to do. And, and the, the same old, same old isn't working anymore. So you kind of answered my follow up question. And I know fans may think of this. How surprised are you, though, about how this offense has looked the past two weeks? Because you said you said it was predictable. Um, but did you predict the offense looking this anemic, though? Uh, no, sir. I mean, certainly not the way it's not, not in the off season, not the way it started. Um, and I mean, even against Utah, you know, Oklahoma state moved the ball at times, uh, just, you know, there were some really bad decisions made. Um, and then, you know, you have a quarterback uh, swap. I know we're going to talk a lot about quarterbacks, uh, but you know, <laughs> you, you bring in Rangel and, uh, you know, he looks like he looks uh, cold. He just, you know, he, he looks kind of like, um, you know, when you throw a pitcher that just hasn't warmed up properly, um, just look like he, his timing wasn't quite, quite there. Some of his balls seemed a little, little shaky. Um, you know, just not quite crisp spirals. Uh, and, and then all of a sudden you, you're just, you know, you're just in a huge hole. I, I, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have expected what happened at, at Kansas State. And I mean, if you look back, Oklahoma State moved the ball consistently. And the, even in the second half, I think Oklahoma State moved the ball better than people probably remember. The reason nobody, you know, you don't remember it is because those drives didn't amount to anything. You know, it'd be a, a couple big plays and then it'd just be bad play after bad play after bad play. And then it's a punt. And it's not even, you know... When Oklahoma State's punting, it's not even close. It's not even like, well, can they go for it? They can't go for it. <laughs> it's um, it's third and long. Or, I mean, it's fourth and long. Like, you know, it's just – but, yeah, I, I wouldn't have expected the offense to be this anemic. Uh, again, I, I think some of this stuff, hindsight, you can kind of go back and maybe predict that the offense is going to look this way. 
But no, I'd be lying if I said I thought things were going to go this way. Even after the Utah game, I, I didn't expect the offense to come out and lay another egg quite like they did against Utah. So let, let's get into what has been buzzing, and that is the quarterback position. We saw Mike Gundy make a quarterback change against Utah when Alan Bowman throw, threw two interceptions this week, another multi-interception game. Um, just to read off his stats, 26 of 50, one touchdown, two interceptions, a 52% um, completion percentage. Is it time for Mike Gundy to fully make that quarterback change moving forward? I think it's time for Oklahoma State's offense to make a change. And and I don't know if that involves a quarterback change or not. To be honest, everybody wants to see Zane Flores. I've, you know, I, I probably spent more time talking with Oklahoma State fans online about Zane Flores than uh, I've spent doing anything else. Uh, the <laughs> truth is, none of us have seen Zane Flores. And maybe, uh, you know, fans make the argument, uh, he can't be worse. Well, I would, the only thing I would say is... I, Fans were excited to see Rand Gale come out to start the second half against Utah, and they seemed pretty <laughs> relieved to see him leave the field against Utah <laughs> for Bowman, uh, to come back. So uh, now Zane Flores, I will say, I haven't seen him play. If you, you can look up his stats in high school, also what I have seen in practice, he does seem to be by far the most athletic quarterback out of the bunch. I think there's a case to be made. You know, Gundy said one of the reasons they struggled to – uh, they gave up so many big runs at Kansas State, which was by far the biggest disappointment. If, if that to me was the thing, just that they could not stop the running backs at all. But Gundy said the reason those backs had big days is because Avery Johnson's a mobile guy. Well, if Zane Flores can be uh, even just slightly mobile, does that mean Ollie Gordon can get going against other teams? I to me, that's if you're going to make the argument for Zane Flores, I think that's the argument. He's a younger guy. He's definitely going to make more more mistakes. I know people are upset with Alan Bowman. Um, nobody's talking to me about Rangel anymore. Um, but <laughs> uh, I mean, if you're going to throw Flores out there, he's going to make mistakes. Avery Johnson made mistakes for Kansas State, and you know, entering the season, people were talking about him like a top ten quarterback potentially. Younger guys are going to make these mistakes. Um, so you have to be able to live with that. If Zane Flores does see the field this year, that said, can he be slightly mobile? Can Oklahoma state change its offense to, I mean, a big reason I think Oklahoma state let the game get away from at Kansas state is they ran Bowman twice on back-to-back -back plays QB draw have no problem with it's worked all year. Didn't work at Kansas state, but then the very next play, you're going to run QB power on third down. You're <laughs> trusting, you're trusting Bowman to pick up. The first right. down and with his legs, which is crazy. I think if you put Zane Flores out there, maybe you can do some of that stuff. Um, but I, I don't think the biggest problem with this offense is Alan Bowman. And I, I know a lot of people want to see him pulled. I think the biggest problem is just the way the offense is called. Um, you know, I don't know why Oklahoma State is so – there seems to be this, this – just this – I don't know how many plays, 15 plays, 20 plays – we're going to run these over and over and over again. And it, it hasn't been working lately. Meanwhile, every time Oklahoma state breaks out some, like, uh, I don't know, some cute stuff for lack of a better word, like stuff they haven't been doing um, for the most part, it's worked. So I kind of think the offense just needs a reset and maybe you get that with the bye week but yeah, I mean, uh, and maybe, and you definitely get an offensive reset with Zane Flores because I do not think Zane Flores can run the same offense that Alan Bowman is, is running right now. You know, I think just to kind of piggyback on some of your points, the easiest thing when the offense isn't doing well is just to look at the quarterback. And that very well may be the change that they make during the bye week. But you have to wonder, and if you can answer this, that'd, that'd be great. What is Alan Bowman's leash? Like if they're going to decide to make a quarterback change, do you foresee that happening this week? Do you foresee it happening after the bye? How much room, much more room for error do you think Alan Bowman has before we look at the Zane Flores? Well, I think historically Mike Gundy is more loyal to his guys than, uh, than you see most quarterback or most coaches across the country. Um, I will say typically, and this is, this is not, um, I'm not reporting that I ex I'm necessarily expecting or have heard that this will happen, but typically if quarterback changes come, bye weeks are a great opportunity. You know, we asked Mike Gundy about Zane Flores this week and he said, 
you know, his big thing is Zane Flores can't get those reps in practice. There's not a, he said, what are you going to give him reps in practice? You know, when there's plenty of reps during the bye, <laughs> um, the bye week, not only lets guys get healthy, a lot of coaches use the bye weeks to look at second, third string guys and figure out if any of those guys need more playing time. Um, just, I've covered a lot of coaches across the country. That's a pretty common thread. Um, mm -hmm. so I think Zane Flores will probably get better quality practice reps during the bye week. Now, um, again, who knows if he impresses the coaches, uh, maybe the coaches have already made up their mind that they're going to give him some packages or maybe give him a start who knows. But even after the Utah game, uh, you know, a lot of people pushed that they thought Zane was going to make a move for the number two job. You just was so close to a buy. There's really no reason to make a big change, it, whether that's making Zane the clear number two, making Zane the one, uh, trying Rangel out. Like this close to the buy, it kind of makes sense to just let's roll with what we've got and just try to get to the open week. And then everything can kind of be thrown back on the table. Um, so I, I will say, if you're going to see Zane, I would think it would be after the bye week. Um, as far as Bowman's leash, I think a big reason we're talking about this right now is because college football it doesn't look – the sport is completely unrecognizable from where it was 10 years ago. The transfer portal, NIL, uh, a lot of the people that have uh, been talking to me about Zane, they're worried Zane's going to leave. Hmm. Uh, under the old rules – uh, that's not even a discussion point. You're just talking about, can we win games with Zane? I'm not even seeing people, people aren't even talking to me about winning games with Zane. They're talking about convincing Zane to stay so he can be the guy next year. And I will say, mm -hmm. I do think eventually it's going to get to that point, whether Gundy wants to go with that or not. You do have to think about roster construction. And I don't know if they're expecting Zane to be the guy next year. I certainly think he's going to be the fan favorite going into the competition. Um, but if you think Zane is even has a significant chance to be your starting quarterback next year, you have to keep him from leaving. And if the team isn't winning and, and if losses continue to happen at some point, it does, it does make sense from a roster construction standpoint to at least go, do we need to, do we need to a see what Zane has and give him some game reps, which will help him develop in the off season. And B do we, does, is Zane, does Zane need to see some, loyalty uh from us that we're gonna give him that chance to play next year so he doesn't look around this offseason and you know I, I talked with zane in the preseason he uh he seemed pretty pleased with where he was heading into the year he talked about how much he needed last year to, like he didn't see the field last year he talked about how important that was for his development that coming in the game was faster than he expected and and how much it helped to kind of be the scout team guy but, you know, now Zane didn't tell me I have to play this year. I'm going to go. But if you just look <laughs> around, a lot of college players do have that mindset. And it, that's especially true at the quarterback level. So for our, for our audience, and it is so funny because I feel like we're linked, Tyler. Like everything you're saying is like my follow up questions. Now, I, I, for our audience, I send Tyler a script beforehand, but I never tell him what my follow up questions will be. And I promise you, he has hit every follow up question <laughs> I have. But you, you made an interesting point that I kind of want to double back on about seeing what you have next year. Do you feel like Gundy is hesitant to make this quarterback change because Bowman just, you know, gives him the best chance to win this year? Uh, I, I think Gundy thinks that I, I do. I, I, I think Gundy knows what's on the table this year. Um, I mean, he, you know, I mean, he, he knows Oklahoma state entered the year competing for a spot in the college football playoff. Um, and, and I think, I, I think, I think Gundy wants to get Oklahoma state there. I don't think Gundy wants to be the, you know, one of the most well-known coaches who hasn't competed for a national championship. Um, I mean, I, I don't know why anyone would want to be known as that. You know, if, if you have a chance to get there, get there. Um, I do think Gundy probably thinks Alan Bowman gives this team the best chance to win this year. And let, me, let me let me let me ask you a follow up question, not to cut not to catch you off. But the second part of that question would be, do you feel like if he put in Zane Flores, that's sending a message to the team that we are thinking about next year? Uh, 
it's tough to know the, you know, it's tough to know how that would play out in the locker room. I think a lot of it would depend on how Zane does, especially in, you know, the first game or two, if he does see the field. But I think a little bit, yeah. I mean, a lot of these guys are older guys. You know, Alan Bowman hasn't been here for a long time, but he's a seven year, seventh year guy. Um, I think I would guess that gives him, you know, some of the other guys that have been here for five, six years that they probably feel a sort of kinship to him. Like, Hey, we know, you know, we know what it's like to be a college football player this long. Um, I, I, I do think it sends, it sends, it sends a little bit of a message. I definitely that I think Oklahoma state's thinking about the future. Um, and I think, you know, it's tough because college football hasn't traditionally been this way. This is, this has always been the NFL mindset. Oh, you get to week 15, Maybe you play the backup quarterback or you let some of the backups go in right. um, and just see what you have. See if you want to pay these guys, um, you know, that college football isn't built on that. This is a new mindset, but this is where the sport's going. And at some point, uh, teams have to figure out what they have. And there's only so much evaluation you can do in practice, especially if, like Gundy said, Zane isn't even getting those, those starting reps. Uh, you know, I mean, how much I don't know how much Oklahoma State's learning about what kind of player Zane is right now. Uh, he was getting those reps in Paul Camp, but you know I have, how much has Oklahoma State learned about Zane Flores since Paul Camp? And if if you go the whole season and you don't learn about him, then you know you have the, you have spring. But what if you know if you're if you still don't have a starter named at the end of spring? What if some of these guys decide to go and bounce and go to other places? And you, you don't even know what you're losing at that point, potentially. So um, it's 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 a weird spot and traditionalists are going to hate it. But I do think that's where the sport is. And at some point, you do kind of need to figure out what you have. Last question on quarterbacks before we move on to the next topic, because this this reminds me a little bit about when the Dallas Cowboys was coming into the season and everybody wants to see Trey Lance. And most people who follow the team was like, well, Trey Lance needs to elevate above Cooper Rush to QB2 before we talk about him being a starter. Is Zane Flores still QB3? Is he QB2? How does the depth chart work out in your estimation right now? Um, I mean, I think officially, I, I mean, I, I think Rangel is definitely the number two in, in, from the coaching staff standpoint. Um, in in right. my mind, just from a from a talent standpoint, um, I mean, Rangel, I, the thing I will say in his defense is, that's an awful place to to come in for your first meaningful game action this year against maybe the best defense you'll see. Um, second half of a game already, you know, trying to get back in it. I mean, that's a tough spot. Um, that said, I think I think Zane has to be the number two. If for no other reason, then I think he just gives you a different dimension. Um, and, and now I will say Zane's athleticism you know, might be overblown. It, it might not be this huge uh, game. You know, Oklahoma State's offense might not look that different with Zane. Mm -hmm. But I do think it gives Oklahoma State a few wrinkles that Rangel can't. So I, I think for that reason alone, he probably should be the number two guy. Um, or that's just how I see it. I, I think at least because it gives you something different. Rangel, to me, is going to come in and run a similar offense to what Alan Bowman is. And he hasn't beat Bowman out to this point. So I just don't see how you get anything out of him being in that number two spot. Oklahoma State, they play West Virginia um, this weekend, 3 p.m. Saturday on ESPN2. Um, Tyler, where do you have Oklahoma State ranked in the Big 12 right now heading into this weekend? And also I'll combine this into that. What is their ceiling right now? Yeah, so uh, I think I've had Oklahoma State, even after the loss to Utah, I still had Oklahoma State as a top three, top four Big 12 team. I started the year, I had Oklahoma State as the team to beat in the Big 12. Um, looking at it now, I have Oklahoma State seventh. Uh, I have, uh, mm -hmm. uh, just to run through the list, I have BYU, Iowa State, Kansas State, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah, all ahead of Oklahoma State. Um so that, that's just, you know, I think Oklahoma State from just a talent potential standpoint, I still think this team uh, is top half of the conference. And honestly, like if this team can put some wins together, like I have no problem looking at Oklahoma State as, as one of the best teams in the Big 12 again, but they just haven't played to that point. 
Um, I have West Virginia as the as the tenth best team in the Big Twelve. Just um, you know, I think West West Virginia's played a tough schedule. To be honest, I'm not totally sure what kind of team West Virginia is. They haven't played <laughs> the same schedule the rest of the conference has. Um, so we'll find out this week. In terms of Oklahoma State's ceiling, I you know, I at this point, I'm gonna say I think Oklahoma State's ceiling is probably uh fourth in the Big 12, maybe third. Um ever I know everybody's everybody's kind of panicking right now because of two losses. Those are two tough. I mean, Utah and Kansas State back to back. Uh the only other team I think to have an equally bad draw this year is Utah, who had to play Oklahoma State and then got Arizona off a bye. And we we saw Arizona just go and whip Utah over the weekend. Um so I, I you know, I just I think that's a tough start. You look at the back half of the schedule, there's a lot of very winnable games, a lot of games against teams nobody thought would be good in the Big 12 this year. I think Oklahoma State can gobble up some wins late. The problem is I don't think I haven't seen anything from this team that tells me this team can run the table and go seven and zero. And so I think there's not a game on the schedule that I think Oklahoma State will definitely lose. I just I can't envision this team the way the offense is going right now, a defense that looked like maybe the best in the Big Twelve against Utah, and then looks like it had never seen a running back before at, at Kansas State. Like I can't imagine this team running the table. So. I got to factor in probably one loss, probably to a team that nobody projects. And there's no way the team gets back into the top two or probably even three if that with three losses. With, with two losses, I think you can make a great case. There's, uh, you know, Oklahoma State is on on track for third, maybe even second if if it gets a little bit of help. But there's, I just can't. I can't, I can't make the case that this team runs the table. Final question, um, Tyler, what does Oklahoma State need to do to win against West Virginia this weekend? Oklahoma State has to stop uh, the West Virginia running backs from having a career day. Um, it, I mean, if you look back, the Kansas State game, even with how the offense looked at times, that game is winnable if Kansas State's running backs aren't averaging like 20 yards a carry it, if for stretches or more. Um, I mean, if you can, you know, if, if you can stop the run or at least limit it, make, you know, Avery Johnson didn't have to make that many decisions for huge stretches of that game. And early in the game when he had to, he made mistakes. I think Oklahoma State secondary is good enough to make other quarterbacks make mistakes. The problem is if you give up these big runs to running backs, they never have to even, they, they never get the chance to make mistakes. Your secondary right. doesn't get the chance to, to capitalize. So, I, everybody's going to talk about um, West Virginia, another mobile quarterback coming in. Honestly, after what I saw this week, let the mobile quarterback, I, I didn't think I'd say this after the Arkansas game, let that guy run all over you. Stop everybody Stop everybody <laughs> else from running all over you. Because it at least forced that guy to make more decisions at that point is what I would say. Um, I do think West Virginia's offense is, is probably worse than Kansas State's. Um, I think if Oklahoma, again, I think if Oklahoma state can stop the run, especially from the running backs, I think they can, they can get back into this. So to me, that's, that's the biggest thing I'm watching. Uh, everybody's talking about the Oklahoma state's quarterbacks. Uh, I, I just don't think it matters. I think Bowman, Zane Flores, Rangel, whoever could come out and throw for 600 yards. If, if Oklahoma state's defense can't tighten up against the run, I don't think it matters at all. And so to me, that's the thing I'm watching this week. Can you make West Virginia air the ball out? And at which point, I kind of like Oklahoma State's defense. And then we can talk about, you know, can the offense get its act together to to get some points and turn field goals into touchdowns? But uh, I don't know. To me, that's the thing I'm watching is, is West Virginia's running backs. All right. So Oklahoma State, West Virginia, 3 p.m. Saturday on ESPN2. Both Tyler and Bill will be back with you guys Saturday. Um, To recap everything, Oklahoma State, wise maybe a quarterback change you'll never know um continue to check osu sports extra.com throughout the week for all the advanced coverage we have and post game coverage and i'll be back with these guys well tyler and bill next week um maybe for a little midweek or mid-season report on just how osu has done up until that point so for your host jawan lee and tyler waldrop this has been the osu sports extra show and we'll see you guys next week